Hello church family, I wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas and give you kind of a Christmas greeting and to thank you so much for all the love um, and affection you've shown for us and for baby Cora and the wonderful gift and the food. Uh, we appreciate y'all so much and we're looking forward to seeing you again this Sunday. I also wanted to give you kind of a Christmas thought um, for today, for last night, for Christmas Eve, for Christmas Day, uh, kind of a Christmas devotional. Uh, it's from Acts 26, 26, where Paul is defending himself before <clears throat> King Agri Agrippa. And he says, <clears throat> as he's speaking, Festus, who's there as well, says, uh, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter, utter words of sober truth. For the king, Agrippa, knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. I've always thought that was an interesting way for Paul to phrase that. These, this has not been done in a corner. It's odd to me because if you think of the Christmas story, it seems that that is exactly what it was done in, in a corner. Um, if you look at the, the facts of the case, so Jesus is born to no-name parents. They're not nobility. They're not royalty. They're not famous. Um, in Luke chapter 2, Mary seems to understand this and she, as she refers to herself as a humble bond slave and that she magnifies the Lord because he has given her this great honor she whom uh, has no honor in a worldly sense. She's this lowly, poor woman. So he has no-name parents. He comes from a no-name birth town. Uh, Micah chapter 5 verse 3 refers to Bethlehem as being too little to be among the clans of Judah. This little bitty town of Bethlehem would give birth, or from, from Bethlehem would come forth this king. Then his his hometown of Nazareth is a no-name town. Uh, when people um, hear that Jesus is from Nazareth, they say, can anything good come from Nazareth? This is a backwater hick town. So the, the Messiah would come from there? Surely not. Jesus' job was a humble job. They, they uh, respond again during Jesus' ministry by saying, is this not the carpenter? Is this not the son of the carpenter? Don't we have his sisters here and his brothers it's almost like being told that al the guy that hangs down hangs out down at the hardware store is the messiah and you see him when you go in there and get your nails and you're like al the guy that sits in the corner that never says anything he's always wearing suspenders he's got a john deere cap but that's the messiah that doesn't make any sense and you have the messiah coming the messiah who's the savior of the world coming from these humble jews who are not uh, rulers of the world. They weren't the mighty Romans, the mighty Assyrians, the mighty Babylonians. If anything, they were perennial underdogs, perennial losers, beat down all the time. And, and the Messiah is going to come from this group of people? Surely it would be a Hittite, uh, uh, a Greek, you know, somebody that, somebody like Alexander the Great who had this power, this fame, these wonderful um, gifts of eloquence and splendor of course he is the son of god and he has these things but from a worldly perspective he comes from such humble stock as these jews and of course the christmas story he's born in a humble manger not in a palace not in in opulence and grandeur but in dirt with the animals in, in a stable in the middle of the night, not even in an inn. Isaiah 53 refers to this coming servant of God, this Messiah, as having no stately form or majesty, nothing about him that we would uh, be drawn to, his, his form, his appearance. And so when Paul says that these things weren't done in a corner, to me, I'm thinking, yeah, Paul, it kind of seems like they were. In, in, if anything, in, this, in, in the way of his birth, it was... I don't know that you can get any more cornier than that. That is a that is a corner of corners. No Whereville, no 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 parents of any renown, no um, no people, no background, nothing that would commend him to be the savior of the world. 
And so how does Paul arrive at this understanding or use this phrase that is not done in a corner? Well, in the context here in Acts 26, he has said this after he has already said, uh, in the previous verses, he's already said, uh, he's described his Damascus Road experience, and then he comes to verse 22, and he says, Having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And then Festus says, you're going out of your mind. So then when he, in verse 26, when he says, these things have not been done in a corner, he says, I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice, the king's notice. And these things he's talking about is the prophets, what Moses has said, what the prophets have said. And then verse 23, that the events of Jesus being led to death and, and the... Um, miracles that Jesus did before his death, and then the miracles of the disciples done after his death, Paul is saying, you know the prophets pointed to Jesus. You know the miracles that were prophesied that he would do. And then you know that these things took place, that they were fulfilled. <clears throat> In verse 27, he says to King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Earlier in, verse 20, in chapter 26, Paul says of King Agrippa, I, I readily make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. So Paul says, Agrippa, you've studied these prophets. You know the, the Jewish faith. You know that Jesus perfectly fulfills all of these prophecies. And so this is not done in a corner because the prophets have trumpeted, trumpeted it, this, have spoken about this um, years before, decades before, centuries before. So it's not done in a corner, as I said, number one, because the prophets have proclaimed it. They pointed to salvation in his birth and in his death. And as we see, especially in Isaiah uh, verses, uh, chapters 7 and 9. But also, as he says in verse 20, if we go up a little further, or sorry, no. Uh, yeah, you have to go up a little further, uh, verse 22. So he having obtained help from God, and he's referring there, I think, to his depiction of, in the preceding verses, about his Damascus Road experience. So Paul says, The prophets have proclaimed Jesus' coming. These signs of wonders have accompanied his coming in his ministry on earth, and in his uh, resurrection, and in his, the, the signs and wonders that are done by the apostles in his name. And so, so Paul is saying, In these signs and wonders, they are attesting to the truth of the prophecies. And they are attesting that the prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Also, I think we have the wonderful um, spread of the gospel after the resurrection, that it just spread like wildfire. And so Paul's saying, you, Agrippa, know these things. So it is not done in a corner. But it's interesting that if we look at the birth of Christ, it was, in a sense, done in a corner, in a small, humble way, but then it just boomed, it blossomed, and it spread. It makes me think of Jesus' parable of the mustard seed, that is the smallest seed, but then it is planted and it grows into a great tree that is the largest, that is bigger than all the other garden plants, is what it says. So the story of redemption begins with this little baby in an obscure town, from, from an obscure family, raised in an obscure town, with an obscure, kind of lowly job. And he, from that, uh, grows to become the uh, miracle-working Messiah and when he begins his earthly ministry. Then he goes to the cross and dies, and life, eternal life, is in his name. And the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, uh, made up of the people of God, grows and grows and grows until it is larger than all the plants. So why is this the case, to go from being done in a corner to being spread all over the world? And even we can see now that most of the world knows about Christmas. And if you ask them, what is Christmas about? They could tell you, well, the birth of baby Jesus. Of course, they may not believe that he's the savior of the world. They may not understand that, that the gifts, um, how they are related to the, the gifts of the wise men. They may not understand all these traditions, but they can give you the basic account of Jesus's birth. So it is spread over the whole world. Everyone knows it. Well, I think we get uh, uh, an understanding of what Jesus or what God is doing here in the story of Jesus being begun in obscurity but ending 
as we see in Revelation, with every knee bowing, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it spreads over all the world. We see, I think, the answer to this in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, starting verse 26. Of course, this has been the discussion through the chapter, but I think it, Paul really simplifies it or um, focuses it in verse 26. So he says, verse 25, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption." So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If we were tasks, tasked as men and women to work this plan of redemption, of course we couldn't do it because we're not God. But if we were even tasked to organize it, to, to, to somehow get a grassroots movement and get people all over the world excited about this person, Jesus Christ, we couldn't do it. If he began in this corner, to, so to speak in this obscure way, we'd have to convince people that this this lowly carpenter, born to lowly parents from Nowhereville, is the king of the world. They'd say, that doesn't make any sense. We, in our human way, would say, we need to get him some powerful, well-known connections, parents, friends, we need to make him money, we need to get a, a, a network of, of, of news and heralds and propaganda, I would say propaganda, but information, uh, networking to get it out in the world so people will know about him. It's not going to work. So God is using these humble means, this baby, to show his glory and accomplishing his plan of redemption through it. He says, the despised things, the base things, the lowly things, the humble things, God uses so that no man may boast before God. And then verse 30, this is a key. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. So don't so that's the message what I'm saying right today for you for Christmas is by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. Not because you read a story about a baby and you liked how it ended and you said, I'm going to choose to believe that because it's cute and I want to avoid bad things like hell and death. No, God has saved you in Christ Jesus by his doing in Christ Jesus. He grants you faith and repentance he opens up your eyes to see the truth of who Jesus is. So you recognize in this baby, the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Messiah. And you recognize in the cross what it means for your sin to be placed on him, for your punishment to be placed on him, and your eternal life to be granted through him. So I hope you remember that uh, in this Christmas story, that it is not about what God, um, it's not only about what God has done for you, but it's ultimately about what God has done for his namesake, for his glory, in saving you. That he has accomplished his will, his purpose in salvation through these humble beginnings, beginning in these humble ways in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Of course, it preceded that in prophecies well before, before the foundation of the world. But in an earthly, physical, incarnational sense, to be done in such a slow, lowly way, to not even begin his ministry until the age of 30, and then to blossom, of course, across the whole face of the earth and into all creation, the universe. That is God glorifying himself in doing it all from beginning to end. So let me pray for you. Let me pray for the church. And I hope you have a good Christmas. Enjoy the food, the fun, the fellowship. Uh, but remember always that it was God glorifying himself in the story of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for the love and affection that are there. I pray, Father, that, th that this Christmas, though we are under restrictions, um, we are not able to visit, maybe, as, as much as we like, or go across the country, or go down south for us. I pray, Father, that you keep central in our minds and hearts um, your plan of redemption for the glory of your name through 
Jesus being born as a baby, growing to be a man, um, performing miracles that to um, testify to the truth of the gospel, to who he is, dying for sinners on the cross and being resurrected for eternal life um, to those who believe. Let us, Father, keep that as, as the center of our Christmas celebrations. Even as we are around maybe family members who are not saved, let us be ever ready to give that testimony to the truth of who the baby Jesus is. Not just a cute hallmark story, but the King of Kings born in a lowly manger, the smallest of mustard seeds planted, growing to become the largest of all garden plants. Father, we thank you for the promise of your kingdom being fulfilled and that you will bring all your elect in, all your children home, and you will bring us all the way to glory where we will be free of sin and sorrow and fear, and then we will rest for eternity in your perfect love. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray, amen.